what I think really drew me to writing plays was a sense of frustration with uh, kind of African American characters that I'd seen portrayed on television in the movies. And I'm a big fan of Hollywood movies, but the movies of the 30s and 40s, you know, when I know, with my family, they were school teachers and wives of doctors and they were running funeral parlors and um, a good family friend ran a funeral parlor. Well, the only characters I saw in those incredibly, they were wonderful movies, you know, but The Thin Man, Myrna Lai, and William Powell, they were great, but they, they, had, they would have a, a black maid. Um, and I think my, my play The Bridge Party grew out of this desire to show African American characters in their full humanity as, and not just portrayed as reacting to race. And in these characters, there is a racial incident in the play. A young man is lynched, but it's how these women respond to it and still maintain their full humanity. And that's, that's been the thing that's been really important for me. So I look for that. I use my own family to uh, portray that world. And my other play that I did recently, The Will, takes place in, in 1866. And again, I wanted to show that full depth of humanity. Um, one thing, I had my, and it's a long story, but I did have my great-great-grandfather Cyrus's will, and he came there as a free black to Tennessee in the 1830s and started a church in 1840. And this October, we're going to celebrate our 165th anniversary. And that church is still there in Columbia, Tennessee. It's the oldest Baptist church, the oldest black Baptist church in Columbia, t in, in the, in the state of Tennessee. It's the oldest, oldest black Baptist church in the state of Tennessee. And this was started by my family, uh, my great-great-grandmother and my great-great-great-grandparents. So I actually, through a, a set of circumstances, which is also interesting, I did find my uh, Cyrus, my great-great-grandfather's will. The interesting thing about that will, even though I knew Cyrus was a he taught school. I have 1850 papers that show him teaching at the church. And I know he was a great reader. He loved um, Shakespeare. And I know these stories about Cyrus. Well, on his will, which is written beautifully, they have him signing an X. And, and, and there are a lot of instances like that when, you know, you kind of bury the whole notion of African Americans as intelligent people. So when you hear about a political candidate and people say they don't know him, what they mean is they don't know of African Americans like that. It's not a part of their experience. And one of the reasons it's not a part of the experience is because for so long we've buried these stories. You know, we've created exceptions. Frederick Douglass is the exception. Whereas if, you know, I know that in my family there were other people like that. So what I wanted to show was this is just a a typical, not a typical guy, but this is a man, and there had to be other Cyruses. And I showed the family life. Uh, they had a farm there, the kind of things they did, the people that came, their sons who had been in the Civil War, and showed them close up. And I wanted to present people that had not been presented. And uh, this is a play about, about African American women in the 40s. And as a matter of fact, the bridge party was performed here at U of M in 98. And Ruby Dee played the, the mother in the play. And that was a wonderful experience. So it's uh, also available on Amazon.com. And as I said, I have a few, a few copies here. And, and I that comment that Beverly made about language, one of the things I wanted to do in the play was to try to recreate the language of those women, my mother and her friends in the South, because just a lot of the things about them, I felt that if we didn't record those voices, that they were in danger of being lost. And that whole lifestyle of those women who, who at midnight on Saturday, they laid their hands down, didn't play bridge on Sunday, just that whole world they lived in. It was just a beautiful world, and I didn't want it to be lost. My own experiences as a writer, and I think everything I write has a historical basis, and I do do a lot of research to do my writing. 
One thing I could use as an, as an example would be uh, the work I've done on Sally Hennings. And it started out in a kind of interesting way. I was approached by a composer, William Balcom. You might know him. He's a, um, he's a U of M uh, prof, School of Music. And he came to me and asked for a piece about Sally Hemings. And, and I thought, wait a minute, Sally Hemings. And all I could really think of was, uh, well, I hate to say this, like Bodice Ripper. Uh, I, I, I thought about uh, Nick Nolte and Jefferson in Paris, and I really hated that movie. And I just didn't see what I had to add to that. And I mean, I'm not trying to say that everything, because I'm a great romance fan. I grew up on Frank Yerby and all those great writers. So I am not, you know, in any way, uh, saying that romance is any, any less, but in, for my own particular writing, I wanted to do something that had a, um, to bring something new to the work. And in order to really get a handle on that, I had to go back and I had to look at my own family history of um, free blacks in the 1700s, 1800s. And once I started thinking about my own stories, I talked about my grandmother and she used to tell these family stories, then it started to make sense. So I went and I did all this research. I spent about a uh, year, I didn't go to Monticello, but I spent such a long time doing research, um, looking at all these different things, cookbooks, slave narratives, stories about enslaved, uh, first-hand research about enslaved women, uh, men, and everything I could get my hands on. But the thing about history is at some point you have to be able to put it down because it's a lot of baggage. So after I'd done all that research, and this was to write a libretto, to write a text that was set to music and was sung by a mezzo-soprano named Florence Quivar. After I had done all that research, then I had to set it a, a lot of it aside because actually your characters don't know the things you know. They also don't, um, don't have that, you know, hindsight. They can't, they're in the middle of things, you know. So what you do, is, it's what I do, and it sounds kind of weird maybe, but it's as if you're going back in a time machine. You go back there, and that's why it helps to do it early in the morning. And I would do a lot of this at 3 and 4 in the morning before my kids got up to go to school. Before the phone rings. Can't have the internet on. Can't be going on Google and all that stuff. You get there and you're in this time machine and you go back and you step into the world of that character. You're not that character but you step into the world of that character. And that character talks, and that character says things, and that character surprises you, and you allow that character to tell stories. And that's how that piece came about. And the nice thing about it is I did, when this work was performed at the Library of Congress, um, at Coolidge Auditorium, about 45 of Sally Hemings' descendants came. I had never met any of them and I got the nicest note saying, thank you for telling our mom's story. All right. So that really meant a lot to me. So that's how that history uh, played. But I had to tell a story. I, I couldn't give them all that stuff that I had uh, researched. It's true that I did get up and write. And when my kids were in high school, I would write at, at 3 and 4 in the morning because they, had, they got up at 6. Um, and, you know, I don't think, you know, I think it really matters whether you use yellow paper or blue paper, or whether you have soft lights and all that kind of stuff. <coughs> and basically, you just have to be sitting there. You have to fix your you-know-what to that chair. But in chair. And that's how it happens. A, a painter friend of mine called it the Who Me Syndrome. He said you can um, do nine sketches of a particular, of an object or whatever. And a guy named Al Loving, a Detroit painter. And Al said, um, it's that tenth time that you try it 
and all of a sudden it's there and you think it's some kind of surprise but it's because you've been sitting there and you've done it all these other times and something takes over and it comes to life and he calls it the who me syndrome you didn't know you could do it but you did it and a lot and very often people are worried as they write whether they'll be able to do this whether they'll be able to take on this subject and what happens is once you've written for a while and I've written fiction and plays, although I primarily do plays, is something will happen and it might be page 50 and you figure out, well that's where the beginning is and the rest of the stuff didn't matter, but you have to write to actually get there. And it's, uh, I just finished doing this one act play and he's in, uh, in Lansing and uh, I never, for a long time I didn't know how to really go on with that play. And I just figured out that what I thought was the end of the play was actually the middle. And I think this must happen with books, too. Absolutely. But uh, I think, as far as plays go, it's a different kind of process because you're collaborating with a group. So I just did a play of mine called The Will. I did it up in Idlewild. And that play that I brought there, there are little things that had to be changed because if you come across a word or something that, a, that an actor can't say, if an actor stumbles off, of, uh, off a line, if it doesn't make sense in the staging, you have to take that out and you have to change things while the play is in rehearsal. And the last scene of the play wasn't right, so about three days before the production went up, I had to rewrite a last scene, final scene. So plays, you're always doing rewrites. You can be doing rewrites the night before, you can be writing whole speeches, um, and you, you have to be able, be able and ready and willing to do rewrites. And you can't feel too sensitive because a lot of directors, they're not sensitive. <laughs> and if you think your stuff is precious, then you'll be very miserable and unhappy as a playwright. <laughs> so a lot of my stuff has, you know, they'll say, well, you need to rewrite that or you need to get rid of that or, you know. That's the way it works with plays. There are some things that a writer um, gets by way of being a writer that money can't buy. And one of them is the opportunity to be around and be stimulated by other writers. And this panel today, and just seeing Cassandra here on the horizon and hearing that, uh, that uh, Beverly and I have both used those WPA stories and Betty, to be around Betty, whose articles I've admired for so many years and to see the kind of stuff she's doing. So you get stimulation from other writers. Now to go to the money part. <laughs> well, I made a living teaching creative writing. I taught uh, creative writing at, at Central Michigan University. I taught playwriting and fiction writing. And that's how I made money as a writer. And you know, my tenure was based on publishing things or getting things produced. But could I have ever made a living as a writer doing the kind of writing I do? And I, I can only speak for myself. No. Well, because plays are so expensive. It's so expensive to put on a play and produce a play. So you're lucky if you break e even. And as a librettist, even though, you know, I'm a member of BMI, but I'll tell you, um, you know, there's Madonna, there's the rap singers. There, I get the BMI magazine and there's a page at the end for classical music. And so, you know, but you do it because you feel that there's something, story you want to tell. Or something. But as far as the money goes, just 